Hello loves, welcome back. And we are going to do the sequel, Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver 2. I'm excited. Uh, it may not have come across as clearly as I would have hoped, but I did enjoy the first one. Despite how it ended with a to-be-continued cliffhanger. This is the manual for the for, for the second game. And I wanted to look into it to see if the controls were the same. And then I saw that there is a section right here. The history of Nazgoth. Quite a few pages of it. And then we got all this stuff here. So today, not hopping into gameplay. Today I want to take a look at this. I miss the manuals having lore and stuff in them. Granted, it there's two sides of it. A lot of people are like, well, why you why do you need the uh, lore and all the information back to the manual when it should be told in the game? I completely get it, but I miss having the option of it being in the manual. But I don't like if if it's necessary, required knowledge. Which this shouldn't be. <laughs> so, let's hop over to page 9. History of Nazgoth. Alright, so the pillars. Centuries before Cain's birth, the land was protected by an oligarchy of sorcerers known as the Circle of Nine. Okay. Guardians were sworn to serve and protect the pillars of Nazgoth. Which are now around Cain's throne. They moved, or was this throne built there? The ancient edifice towering over the earth as a manifestation of the mysterious power that preserved and gave life to the land. But the circle was infiltrated by dark forces, and Ariel, the balance guardian, was cruelly murdered. Oh. Oh. She is very important. Huh. That's the, uh, ghost... Lady, I believe. I believe. Her assassination sent psychic shockwaves throughout the circle, and in their derangement, the remaining sorcerers turned their powers to dark purposes, poisoning the land with their sorcery and abandoning the pillars to stand like silent, decaying sentries. Interesting. And she's just stuck there. Trapped with the pillars. Interesting. Into this dying world, Cain was born, the son of an aristocrat, aristocratic Nazgoth family. He lived the privileged life of a, of a nobleman, never realizing his undiscovered destiny. That he was marked from birth as Ariel's successor, fated to take her place as the guardian of balance. Interesting. So, Ariel's spirit slash soul is stuck there but he's actually the next or current guardian of balance interesting ignorant of his destiny the ambitious but directionless cane roamed the land during one fateful journey he was ambushed by brigands and murdered cruelly impaled on his assassin's sword okay dark covenant Plucked from the brink of oblivion by the necromancer Mortanius, Cain awakened in the underworld, still transfixed by his enemy's blade. Tormented by his hunger for vengeance and heedless of the spiritual cost, Cain recklessly accepted the necromancer's offer of revenge and rose from his tomb to discover that he had been resurrected as a vampire. So was he the first? Though. There are, um... Blood Omen 1 and 2, I believe, which take place before Soul Reaver, which are focused on Cain, likely, I believe, tells this story. Interesting. I don't mind this spoiling stuff from that. I'm not going to play Blood Omen 1 and 2. I'm sorry. Not, at least not as a blind playthrough on the channel. Um, let's see. 
King quickly tracked down his assassins and exacted his bloody revenge. With his vengeance and hunger sated, he sought only a cure for the vampire curse that afflicted him, so he tried to get rid of it. Huh. Guided by, by Mortanius and the Spectre Ariel, now bound helplessly to the decaying pillars she once served, Cain hunted down each of the corrupt sorcerers now poisoning Nosgoth. Only with their deaths could the pillars be healed, and only by restoring balance would Cain be released from his vampiric curse. What went wrong? At first, reluctant to live the horror of an existence blighted by a thirst for human blood, Cain soon adapted and discovered within his darkened soul a growing dissatisfaction for humankind as he embraced his newfound immortality. During his journey, Cain discovered and claimed the Soul Reaver, an ancient soul-devouring blade, and stumbled across, not so coincidentally, a time-streaming device created by Mobius, the Guardian of Time. Okay. Against the council of the ancient vampire Vorador, there was vampire before him. Huh. Cain found himself embroiled in human events, caught in a bloody battle between Otmar's army of hope and the ruthlessly advancing armies of the Nemesis from the north. Other countries. As the tide of the battle turned, Cain used his only means of escape, the time-streaming device which swept him nearly 50 years back into Nosgoth's path. Past. Hoping to alter the course of Nosgoth's history, Cain assassinated the young King William the Just, who would become the diabolic tyrant known as the Nemesis. After, sailing in, after sating himself on his victim's blood, Cain returned to the present, only to discover that his murder of the beloved king had ignited a genocidal war against vampires, led by the time streamer Mobius himself. Cain is responsible for the hunt of the vampires. Huh. Upon his return, Cain witnessed the future that he had wrought, and the final triumphant act of Mobius's cold-blooded mob. Borodor, the last of the era's vampires, is guillotined, and his head held aloft for a cheering, bloodthirsty crowd, leaving Cain the sole surviving vampire in Nosgoth. So Borodor was the only vampire before... Well, no, he, he was the last of the original era, of the original vampires. He was the last of the original vampires. Okay. And that left Cain as the only vampire. Which he then went and turned... Like... The greatest, I'm thinking, of the Seraphim Into his children. Interesting. Fateful Dilemma. As his quest brought him full circle, Cain confronted the destiny that Mortanius and Ariel had hidden from him, that he was the Balance Guardian, and that only by sacrificing himself could he restore the Pillars. Ariel presented him with a final climactic decision, sacrifice himself to heal the land, but ensure the extinction of the vampires, or refuse the sacrifice and seal the world's corruption. Revolted by the machinations of the human sorcerers, and alienated from his former humanity, Cain chose the latter path, opting to rule the world in its damnation rather than commit himself to oblivion. This apocalyptic act completed the pillar's destruction, the mighty columns toppled as Cain sealed their ruinous fate, and damned Ariel to ceaselessly haunt the dilapidated pillars she once served. Until the balance is restored, she can never be released. Okay, so pause there. Because I've talked in the first one about how Raziel is extremely naive, and King knows a lot more than is being let on. This really does point, like, paint Kane in a picture of being a selfish tyrant. He was a noble. Noble at birth, assassinated, brought back to kill his killers. He 
wars going on. So he seeks to end the war by preventing it from ever happening. The Nemesis character was viewed as a just king at one point. So going back to that time when it was easier to access him or reach him, Cain kills the king. But because he kills the king when the king is a just figure, he dooms vampires to be hunted. It's like, even him going back in time is like, okay, this is him trying to prevent something bad from happening. This is him knowing the future, knowing different things that others would not know of the time. Kane's used the time thing before. Kane knows and sees things that Raziel is extremely ignorant to. Cain wanted vengeance, yeah. I mean, that is understandable. Why is there a shirt hanging? That's embarrassing. Cain wanted vengeance against those who killed him. Okay. Then he sought to rid himself of the affliction. He viewed it as an affliction. He wanted his revenge, he got his revenge, he's done. Only way to do that is to deal with these people. Okay? He goes to deal with these people. The sorcerers of the circle. War breaks out between the nations. Once again, and it's like, in this time, he doesn't stick to that selfish nature. He sees an opportunity to prevent the wars from destroying and killing off those of Nosgoth. It is a very selfless act that he go that, that he tries to do. His intentions were good. I'm going to go back in time, kill this person to prevent the ruination of the land. Good intentions, but then it damns vampires. So what he does for the people ends up making the people hunt the vampires, which he now is. He can't be... Seeing that even after he did that, the humans are still turning into this bloodthirsty, war-hungry people. He opts to rule the world in damnation rather than commit himself to oblivion. So, finally he gets fed up with it. He's had enough. He's like, I've done this for you guys. No one sees it that way. Okay. Well, the only way to fix this now is for him to die. At that point, he's like, do they deserve it? I don't view him choosing to rule in, in, a, in damnation rather than commit himself to oblivion as the selfless act that this is being painted. I can understand why it would be viewed that way. Let's continue. Cain's empire. Cain concluded with the epiphany that Vordor was right, that vampirism is not a curse but a blessing. The vampires are dark gods whose duty it is to thin the human herd. And now he's starting to think mighty of himself. With intentional irony, Cain established the ruined pillars as the symbolic seat of his new empire and the unrestored balance pillars as the base of his throne. So it is the actual ones. In an act of calculated blasphemy, this really likes to use a epiphany, blasphemy, irony. Interesting choices from the writer. In an act of calculated blasphemy, Cain raided the ancient tomb of the Seraphim 
fanatical order of warrior priests once sworn to eradicate the vampires plaguing Nazgoth. From the desiccated corpses of these long-dead knights, Cain raised his six vampiric sons to become the lieutenants of his fledgling empire. Raziel, Malkia, Zebro, Ra, Duma. We are missing a brother. Unless I'm forgetting something. But the pillars, Cain ultimately realized, were more than just a human edifice. The health of the pillars was tied inextricably into the health of the land. With the pillars left unrestored, corruption seeped slowly into the land like a poison, turning his empire into an irredeemable wasteland. Okay, we're chasing... So, at the end of the first movie, we're chasing him through time. Are we going back to before it's a wasteland? Interesting. Condemned. Rather than evolving slowly over time, the vampires experience periods of accelerated metamorphosis, entering dormant states from which they emerge transformed. When Raziel, first among Cain's lieutenants, revealed his latest evolution, a pair of bat-like wings... Cain responded with an act of seemingly egotistical sadism. Writer, please. Tearing Raziel's newly fledged wings from his back, he ordered Raziel to be cast into the Lake of the Dead, where he would burn forever in the rolling... Is that rolling or roiling? Abyss. Raziel tumbled endlessly into the murky depths, his flesh dissolving as he burned with white-hot fire. After an eternity of torment, Raziel's ruined body came to rest. As the pain receded, he realized that he had not only survived the descent, but had been delivered to the very seat of the underworld. Light came before him. Raziel was saved from the brink of oblivion by a mysterious benefactor. A preacher... Wow. Preternaturally. I know what the word means. I'm not entirely good on pronouncing it. Ancient god dwelling in the depths of the abyss, who transformed Raziel into a devourer of souls, and released him back into the world to take his revenge. Wow, there's more! Ooh! Yay. Vengeance. Raziel, now the elder god's fledgling angel of death, resurfaced to discover that centuries had inexplicably, bleh, inexplicably passed since his execution. Cain's empire lay in ruin, and Raziel found himself assailed by the degenerate offspring of his former brethren, who had long since devolved into monstrous forms. Huh. I don't know that I view them as having devolved into monstrous forms. I mean, some of them I can see why I would say that. But they were dormant in gain their form of power. Um, Duma wasn't monstrously malformed. Melchia uh, is the one that seemed the most monstrously deformed, I think. But it also talked about that he had received the weakest of the gifts and was and his that's why his minions, his fledglings, were also weak. So the deformation could have been part of his transformation. Ra The fish dude dead I mean, it's an understa understandable transformation with his ability. Zebro's kind of the odd one out there. Zebra is definitely the odd one out. I don't know what to think about that, dude. Undeterred by these revelations, Raziel pursued Cain across Nosgoth's blasted landscape. Galvanized by a hunger for revenge and a relentless new thirst, not for the blood of humans, but for the vampire's apostate souls. Only vampires? Cain, however, had other plans for Raziel. Seemingly unsurprised by Raziel's miraculous return, 
Cain baited Raziel along the course of a single-minded vendetta. Yeah. Kind of planned. Channeling him into battle with his mutated brethren, and into a fateful confrontation at the pillars, wherein Cain raised the Soul Reaver against Raziel. The ancient blade, believed to be indestructible, shattered when Cain attempted to strike Raziel down. The soul-devouring sentience captive in the blade was thus released. Sentience? And binding itself to Raziel as a wraith blade, becoming his symbiotic weapon. Cain seemed not stunned, but strangely satisfied with this shocking outcome, and lured Raziel further into Nosgoth's northern wastes, leading to their final confrontation in Mobius's long-abandoned chronoplast chamber. Driven by the fatalistic visions revealed in Mobius's chamber, Cain activates the time-streaming portal that would propel him and Raziel centuries into Nosgoth's past. We are going back. Free will, Cain argues, is an illusion. Their fates are intertwined in ways that Raziel has not yet begun to fathom. Interesting. Very interesting. Stay hydrated. A lot of information there that I'm glad was... A lot of it we understood from the first one. Learning more about Cain from what we don't know from the original Blood Opens is nice. Um, yeah, this is the abilities. Probably gonna come back and look at Fire and Telekinetic Force Project out. No, I know that one. I just don't know the, uh, Duma's ability. I never did figure out how to use that. Okay. Combat looks the same. Lunging attacks. Interesting. Spectral material worlds. That'll still be there. Time travel. Don't know how that's going to work out. Nosgoth's inhabitants. Slough? Sloth? Sleuth? I don't know how you pronounce that. Craven scavengers prowl the spectral realm, preying on the lost souls wandering in the spirit world. Tend to drop one packs in order to corner and overwhelm their prey. The smaller slow are cagey and evasive in combat. The larger brethren are more swift and aggressive. Shades. We know shades. The soulless shadow creatures are able to manifest at will in either spectral or material realms. We don't know shades. They're easy prey, but often confound Raziel by stealing the elements of energy from Fonts and Reaver barriers, thus forcing Raziel to confront them before he can proceed. Okay. Okay. So they're like little arena bosses now that'll block off paths. Thralls! Ancient undead warriors are charged to eternally guard Nosgoth's ancient shrines and challenge any intruder. Some thralls exhale projectiles at Raziel. They'll strive to keep their distance, but will attack if cornered. Thralls sometimes carry emblem keys, which he needs in order to progress. So we're introducing... Keys. So, are we going to have, like, an item or an inventory? Is it just going to be like, hey, you have it? Interesting. Like, uh, what I mean by, hey, you have it, is, like, in Doom. OG Doom. Where you find the key and you just have the key. Vampires. In the historical eras that Raziel visits, he discovers that Nosgoth's early vampires were persecuted and eventually hunted to extinction. Okay, so this is... Is this going to be bef Is this during when they're hunting down the ones like Vorador? Huh. Out of self-preservation, the vampires have retreated from the world, and Raziel therefore encounters few of their kind. Vampire Hunters, so we're going to have more of them. These are the soldiers of Mobius's mercenary vampire hunting army. Swordsmen are slower than their comrades, but more formidable. Pikemen are swift, but their attacks are not as powerful. Cannoneers can be fearsome from a distance, but only have, but have only limited close-range fighting ability. Attack Dogs. Both the Vampire Hunters and their descendants, the Demon Hunters... Wait. 
demon hunters. Use attack dogs, which they've outfitted with cool-looking weapons. Dogs are able to sense Raziel from a longer range than most enemies. They've got sniffers! Sentries! These guardians, often mounted above doorways and archways, will destroy any creature that tries to cross the threshold. Okay. Single blast from a sentry will unerringly shunt Raziel into the spectral realm. Okay. Sentries can never be destroyed, but can be disabled by a specific weapons projectile. Alright. Way to block off paths. Demons. This is interesting. The demons plaguing Nazgoth are able to rip through from the demon realm into the physical world at will. As the spiritual health of the land declines, the barriers between the realms are weakened and become more easily perme permeable. Interesting. Interesting. Because there weren't demons in... The original one, so the demons had been wiped out. Huh. But the people were by Cain. That's an interesting one, because the demon hunters were the descendants of vampire hunters. Likely the vampire hunters that became demon hunters dealt with them. But we don't know if Cain had involvement there. Raziel has to contend with several forms of demon, each armed with its own distinctive attacks, and will often find himself ambushed and trapped by impassable demon barriers, which force him into combat. So we're going to have a lot of arena sections, it sounds like. Okay. Demons are also able to shift between material and spectral at will, and can thus pursue Raziel from one realm to the next. That's interesting. That is a good way of bringing forth more of a threat. As I did talk about in the previous one, we're basically immortal, because like, if we're not fighting a boss, the enemies all they're going to do is poof, knock us into the, the spectral. Now we actually have a threat that will cross between the two. I like that as a design choice. We'll see how well it's implemented. That's exciting. That's exciting. Demon Hunters, with the vampire threat exterminated, Mobius' mercenary army evolved and turned their attention to the demons now menacing Nosgoth. These hunters are more skilled and aggressive than their ancestors. So this is kind of towards the end of when Vordor is cut off and pre came making the Seraphim. That's what it seems like. Whoops, I lost my place. These hunters are more skilled and aggressive than their ancestors. As with the Vampire Hunters, the Swordsmen tend to be slower, but more powerful. The pikemen are swift, but not as strong. Cannoners are formidable, formidable, formidable from a distance, but have a limited close-range fighting ability. Mutants. These degenerate creatures evolved in the decades following Cain's fateful decision at the Pillars. Ah. Huh. They shamble on one deformed limb while attacking with atrophied claw of another. Interesting. So with the land failing, mutants are emerging. Likely from the humans? Which actually, that gives a lot more weight to, uh, if we think about the evolution or monstrous forms of the vampires. Apologies. If the humans had begun to mutate, of course the vampires would as well and develop their other abilities and forms. But Cain being the last, well, Cain being the first of the era and the originator of the newer vampire breed. He was already formed at the time, so he'd be like the prior era's vampires, and he wouldn't evolve. My thoughts, at least. Seraphin Warriors. Okay. The Seraphin are a monastic sect of warrior priests made legendary by their holy war against the vampire menace. In Nazgoth's early history, their Seraphin 
our formidable enemies, renowned both for their ruthlessness and a fanatical devotion to their crusade. He chose those words on purpose. Seraphim warriors are sometimes aided in combat by spellcasting sorceresses who will attempt to flee if cornered. So the people could use the magic. I mean, I know we had the circle sorcerers, of which Mobius was... Uh, Mobius... Was he a part of that? I think he was. Because he used his time thing to see different visions and stuff. Yeah, because he worked with Ariel to help try and convince Cain, didn't he? Hop back. No, that's Mortanius. That's Mortanius. Mortanius was the necromancer. Okay. Mortanius, the necromancer, and Ariel helped him. Or tried to convince him to. So not Mobius. We don't know much about Mortanius then. For a second there, I was confusing the two. I was mixing the two. We'll definitely have to look more into that. But this looks like the first true hint and point out that the humans could cast magic. I don't think there were any that did magic in the first Soul Reaver. Okay. I wasn't entirely certain of what Mobius... Still not entirely certain what Mobius is. That statuesque looking face literally looked like stone at the end of the first one. All right. Two thousand one. Didn't the first one come out in like ninety six? Did they really have to wait that long? Ooh. Oh, that's nice. We have map and compass. Dark Chronicle. Okay, so we can actually go back and rewatch the cinematics. That's nice. So the game does have an epilepsy warning. Definitely need to make sure that that is known. Good thing we checked the manual. All right, loves. I'm even more excited now. Um, this is promising. If there's anything else, non-spoiler, that you think that I should know that I didn't, or that I didn't pick up on, or if you have any opinions on it, let me know. Genuinely curious about this. Curious what you think, and also, yay or nay to my thoughts and opinions. Was Mortanius the sorcerer of the circle then? There's such a limited cast that I expect more tie-ins. So we will have to see. I mean, because with Ariel being a former... The balance. I wouldn't be surprised if Vord or Mobius, Mortanius. Who's some other character? There really aren't many other characters. We're all members of the circle originally. There is definitely hints of forced destiny. Now that I think about it. Because Cain was supposed to become the balance. 
it was a pre-told thing that he was ignorant to. That's interesting. That's interesting. Thoughts and opinions, love. Hope to hear them. Until next time. When we actually kick into the gameplay. Y'all take care.